Hello everyone, my name is Sweta Sampath. I'm a final year medical student at Barts in the London and today I will be covering part two of the respiratory evasion series by Pulse. If you guys have any questions about any of the slides, I will leave an email at the end and you can get in touch. And um, if you do have any feedback to give me about this lecture, then I'd really appreciate it if you did. Um, there will be a link uh, put up on, on YouTube. So the topics we will cover today are, um, firstly, we'll look at interpretation of lung function. We will then move on to look at uh, lung sounds. Then we'll talk a bit about uh, oxygen therapy. And then we'll look at uh, some conditions. So we'll, we'll have a brief look at respiratory failure and the different types. And then we will look in more detail about asthma and COPD. And finally, we will finish off with sleep apnea. So there are different ways in which you can, um, you can use tests to interpret lung function. There are a few different tests available. So uh, the first one is spirometry. So this is the one uh, you probably all heard of. Um, so essentially what this does is that it assesses lung function by measuring the volume of air expelled um, from the lungs after maximum inspiration. Okay, so the, the patient is asked to take a deep breath in and then um, forcefully expire as much as possible. And the way it's used is that um, the results are the results are looked at, and um, it can tell us if the patient has an obstructive condition or a restrictive condition. There's also peak flow, which uh, also is a common test that you probably already know about, um, which is when uh, you have a meter and you ask the patient to blow into the meter as hard as possible and as fast as possible. And this is generally used to monitor obstructive conditions such as asthma. Um, and essentially the way it works is that the greater the patency of your airway, the greater the airflow. And therefore your peak flow uh, reading will be higher. Okay, so uh, next we have the TLCO test. And this is a test to look at how well gas transfer is taking place across your alveoli. And, it's, it, and it does this by measuring, uh, by measuring carbon monoxide uptake. Uh, this is used in conditions uh, such as COPD, which actually involves the smaller airways. And then finally, we have flow volume loops, which I will show you, uh, which I'll show you later on. And essentially, this measures uh, flow at different volumes of air within the lung. There are certain, there is a normal pattern which you should get in a healthy patient, but there are also distinctive pa patterns associated with um, certain types of pathology, which uh, which can then help uh, help us differentiate between. Um, obstructive diseases and restrictive diseases, as well as intrathoracic and extrathoracic obstructions. So essentially, these are the four main tests of lung function. So spirometry, just a bit more detail. So there are three main measurements that you will get by doing a, a spirometry on a patient. So the first one is FEV1 which is forced expiratory volume in one second. So it's how much volume you can ex uh, exhale after you've taken in, in the first second, after you've taken, taken in a deep breath and you've uh, started ex um, expiring. And I, I guess so this is, this reading is similar in a way to the PEFR reading that, that, um, that, can be done using a peak flow meter. So you, the normal value for this should be that it's expressed as a percentage, okay, and it should be more than 80% of uh, the predicted value of for that patient, for their age, for their gender, 
Then we have forced vital capacity, which is the total volume of air that the patient can forcibly excel in one breath. So not in the one in one second, but in the entire breath that they're exhaling out. Again, this should be above 80% of the predicted value for their age and um, uh, gender. Okay, so then there is a third reading, which is also very useful, which is a ratio of FEV1 over FVC. Okay, so this ratio is also expressed as a percentage, and it should be above 70%. So 70% 70 of what of the volume of air that you are blowing out when you exhale should be done so in the first second essentially and that's what's shown as a, as a proportion. So if you look at this, this is a volume time graph. So volume on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. You can see that um, this is where FEV1 is measured, so the volume excelled in one second. And then this um, is the total volume of air excelled in one breath. And this is the graph that you will get, and then you can calculate. Um, but usually it's already calculated for, um, the, the ratio is already calculated for you. Okay, so this is a normal, um, normal spirometry result. So th these are the patients. Patients. You, so you always use. You might have to do a few tries with the spirometry, and you use the best result. So one of the things about spirometry is that it does depend on patient cooperation um, and effort, but not as much as a peak flow reading, for example. And it also detects changes in small airways, whereas peak flow is more for for larger airways. Okay. Right. So. That's that. Uh, we will look at flow volume loops um, in more detail, but essentially this is how it works. So on the y-axis you have flow of air in litres per second, so it's the rate of flow. And then on the x-axis you have volume, so it's got nothing to do with time, it's more to do with volume. So when you start, so it starts at zero and then it goes down like this. So as you take a deep breath in, um, the curve goes on like this, so this is the inspiration curve, and then you have um, your expiration curve after maximal inspiration. Okay, so this is a classic shape that you should get, um, but in pathology this can vary. Okay, so how does spirometry change in disease? So in obstructive disease, such as the main ones would be COPD and asthma, your FEV1 and your FVC will both be reduced, okay? But your FEV1 reduces more than the FVC. So when you look at the ratio, because this is reduced more than this, so the numerator reduces more than the denominator, overall, your uh, your ratio is reduced. So this is an obstructive disease. Some of the causes of obstructive disease can be remembered by the mnemonic CAFE, which is COPD, A for asthma, F for foreign body, and E for, uh, for endobronchial tumour. In restrictive disease, the F, both FEV1 and FVC can reduce, okay? but the FVC reduces more. So in restrictive disease, you have a, redu a re reduction in the total volume, um, total volume of air that's held within the lung. So in that case, this would be then the opposite. So either the FEV1, FVC ratio is normal or it's increased because as you can imagine, if the denominator reduces more uh, than the numerator, the ratio will go up. The causes for restrictive disease can be remembered by the mnemonic paint. So diseases that involve uh, the pleura, the alveolar, the interstitium, any neuromuscular diseases, as well as thoracic cage deformities. So this is something that you should remember. You might get dysphometry results, result that you might have to interpret and 
Um, so the first thing you would do would be to figure out if it's obstructive or restrictive, and then you would think about what the different causes for each one are. Okay. okay. So that's spirometry done. So next we'll look at peak expiratory flow. So like I said, it's the volume of air forcefully expelled in one quick ex exhalation. It mainly measures obstruction in larger airway disease. So it, this is classically used in asthma. The normal values for uh, the patient depend on their age and their sex and their height. So it's higher in male patients, in people who are taller, and uh, in terms of age, the, the normal values sort of increase to 35, 30 to 40 years of age and then starts dropping. Okay, so when would you use this? So it can be used in different scenarios within asthma. So number one, you can, if someone um, is has come into your clinic and you're the GP, and they are presenting with um, features of asthma, but you're not sure, and you would like for them to, you are looking for features such as diurnal variation, then you can give them a, a peak flow monitor and ask them to monitor their peak flow at different times of the day for a few weeks to see if there is variation. You can also give it to someone who has established asthma, and they can then use this just to monitor um, how well they're doing, if their treatment's working, uh, do they need to go back to the doctor, are they having an asthma attack, okay, so they, they can use this, and also you would use a peak flow meter if someone comes in uh, to A&E, for example, and they are having an, an exacerbation of their asthma, you can use peak flow to, it's one of the ways in which you can define the severity of the asthma. So this picture here shows um, the classification of the severity of asthma. And you can see that um, PEFR is used as a way of uh, predicting severity. So if you have a PEFR of 33 to 50% of what it should be, then you, you are having a severe attack. If it's less than 33%, then you're having a life-threatening attack and so on, okay? So that's another way in which you can use it. A common OSCE scenario could be that um, you are asked to teach a patient how to use a peak expiratory flow meter, so this is something worth looking at. Okay, so next, so that's... Uh, peak expiratory flow done. So next we have flow volume loops. So we went over the loop. So it starts off with the inspiration loop and then at maximal um, volume of air, then you have expiration, okay? The dotted line is a normal shape of the loop and um, the, the solid line shows a, a, an example of a flow volume loop in different diseases. Um, it's used. It's measured using a body plethysmograph, and it's a plot of inspiratory and expiratory flow rate on the y-axis and volume on the x-axis. So remember, it's not time; it's volume. Okay. So in asthma and obstructive diseases in general, you will see a classic sort of um, sort of a concave line. So you can see that more in emphysema, instead of it being a straight line, it's 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 way more concave. And this emphysema, it's affecting the expiratory flow, uh, the expiratory curve, I mean, sorry. Okay, and the same with asthma, you can still see somewhat a concave shape appearing here. So if you see something like this, then you immediately want to think, okay, it's the expiratory loop that's being affected more. Therefore, it's probably, um, and combined with the concave shape, it's probably an obstructive picture. Therefore, it could either be an example of COPD, emphysema, or asthma. Okay? In, in restrictive disease, you can see that the shape holds, essentially, but what's reduced a lot more is the volume so in terms of so the when you look at volume you have to look at the difference between 
zero and maximal volume. So you can see that in obstructive disease, it's not really reduced. It's about the same. Whereas in restrictive disease, you can see the volume is reduced a lot more. And this makes sense because in restrictive disease, your FVC um, goes down a lot more. Okay, so, but the important thing is to know that the shape holds. Okay, so that's all of that done. So in the bottom row, you have um, different, different types of obstruction. Okay, so if it's a, if it's an extra thoracic obstruction, we can do this first. You can see, okay, the first thing you would look at is, is the expiratory curve uh, affected or the inspiratory curve. So you can tell it's the inspiratory curve. And the reason for this is because if, if it's an extra thoracic obstruction and you take a deep breath in, your trachea sort of, um, your trachea sort of collapses when you take a deep breath in. So you pull the obstruction um, towards towards the air, airway, therefore you create um, create create more of an obstruction on inspiration, and that's why the curves affected a lot more. Whereas on expiration, when you blow out, the trachea pushes the pushes the um, obstruction out, therefore the expiratory curve is not as affected. And as you can imagine, with an intrathoracic obstruction, it would be the opposite. So you can see that the inspiratory curve is not, not very affected, but the, the expiratory curve is. So essentially, the opposite happens. So when you are inspiring, the obstruction is pushed out. But when you're expiring, the obstruction is pushed in, pulled in. In a fixed obstruction, if you see this sort of shape, then you you know that it's both um, it's it's affecting both curves, and you just see a complete lack of shape here. And if you see this, then you know it's straight away it's a fixed fixed obstruction. Okay, so that's the end of the um, lung function part of the lecture. So now we're going to move on to lung sounds. So when you auscultate, there are lots of different things you might hear if you're in a respiratory ward. So the first thing that you could uh, try and describe is the quality of the breath sounds. If breath, breath sounds are normal, of normal quality, um, which you will learn how to, um, to identify once you start listening to a lot of patients' lungs. If it's normal and the inspiration phase of auscultation is longer than the expiratory phase of auscultation, then you know that this is normal breath sounds, um, which is often described as vesicular. Okay, so if you read a patient's notes and it says vesicular breath sounds, then you know that's normal. You can also have bronchial breath sounds, which are quite harsh sounding, and people say that it's similar to if you put your uh, stethoscope on your trachea and uh, your auscultate, okay? So it's the noise you hear when you do that. Um, however, with bronchial breathing sounds, inspiration and expiration are equal, and there is a bit of a pause in between, okay? Whereas usually inspiration should be longer, okay? And essentially, if you hear this, then it's associated with consolidation. So you might be thinking, of, um, of a pneumonia, for example. Okay. You can also look at the volume of breath sounds. So if you're auscultating over a certain area and you hear that the breath sounds, you, you're not hearing as, as much of a noise um, on that side compared to the other, then you could describe it to be quiet breath sounds, okay, which is indicative of reduced air entry into that area of the lung which might be the case if you're having a pneumothorax or if you have um, a pleural effusion, for example. So apart from the quality and the volume, you can also get added sounds, okay, which are not part of the actual breath sound, as it were. So the most common one probably is um, 
that you've probably heard of is a wheeze and also uh, crackles, wheeze and crackles, you see a lot on the notes. Um, so wheeze is a continuous whistling sound which is produced in the respiratory airways during breathing. Okay, so it's associated classically with asthma and COPD, okay, and also in bronchiectasis. So it's continuous, that's that's important, um, and um, it's it's sort of a um, somewhat high-pitched whistling, whistling that's produced. A stridor is a high-pitched noise. It's much higher pitched than all the other noises, and this is due to an upper airway obstruction. Um, so it could be, if it's a child, then you might think, oh, has this person inhaled a foreign body? Okay, it will be more of an acute picture. Um, but it can also be a chronic picture if you have conditions such as subglottic stenosis. The other sound that you can get are coarse crackles. So these are um, these are not continuous. So it's not like a wheeze, which is continuous. These are discontinuous, brief, popping, long sounds. Um, and again, this is associated with things like pneumonia, bronchiectasis, and pulmonary edema. If it's pulmonary edema, um, you might hear it near the basis of the lungs as opposed to the top. And the pneumonia and bronchiectasis, it depends on which lobe part of the lung is affected. The last sound that you might hear would be fine end inspiratory crackles. So this is uh, usually uh, described as being like when you separate Velcro, okay? It's a sound that you would hear during the inspiration phase of auscultation, but not throughout it, but near the end of the inspiration phase, okay? And these are a lot more fine, and I guess a, maybe a way to describe it would be that they're a bit more uniform compared to coarse crackles. Um, but again, maybe the best way to learn this would be to Google, um, Google all these added sounds and just listen to some clips on YouTube as well as obviously examine patients. Um, and fine end inspiratory crackles is associated with a condition called pulmonary fibrosis. So if you hear this or see this in exams, then you immediately want to be considering pulmonary fibrosis as a possible diagnosis. Okay, right. So next we will move on to O2 therapy. So there are some sort of general principles that you would want to remember about giving oxygen to a patient. So firstly, oxygen is a drug. It's not something that um, should just be given uh, to any patient. There has to be a need for it. There has to be a clinical need and you have to consider the risks that come with it. There are a lot of patients who are very sensitive to oxygen, um, be it a lack of oxygen or be it an excess of oxygen. So you need to be aware of this when you are prescribing it. Oxygen comes out of the wall, on the wards, at 100% concentration, okay, um, volume by air, sorry, whereas the, um, in, in normal air, the percentage of oxygen is 21%, so 21% of normal air is made up of oxygen, okay, whereas when it comes out of the wall is pure 100% oxygen. There are multiple oxygen delivery devices um, and each one will allow a certain flow rate so that the pa your patient can get the, um, the exact amount of oxygen that they need. Okay, And the flow rate of the oxygen in litres per minute can be set on the wall tab and then you connect this to your device which um, should be appropriate to how much oxygen, how, what your flow rate that you have set on the wall is. Um, and then, yeah, and then you just administer it after, after, it's, after it's been prescribed. So on the right, you see, th these are examples of all the different oxygen delivery devices. So the simplest one is the nasal cannula. Um, 
sorry, let me just check. Okay, we'll have a bit more information. So this is a nasal cannula. It goes, um, it has two sort of um, outputs that go into the uh, nose of the patient. And then it's just a tube, which sort of just like goes around the ear. Um, and yeah, so that's nasal cannula. This is a Hudson mask, okay? You connect um, this end, one of the ends, I don't know which one, to the wall and then the other one um, into into the mask and you can just pop it over the patient's um, nose and then use this elastic to fasten over the back of their head. Ventory masks, uh, these are used mainly in COPD and it can give, there are different colours that you can attach, so you, this is removable, you can take it off and attach a different one and it's for different flow rates, okay? Um, just know that if you are giving uh, nebulized drugs, you cannot give it through this mask. Non rebreathe mask. Um, this is used in acute settings. Okay, so the way it works is that firstly you connect the the um, tube to the oxygen output, and once it starts flowing, when the air starts flowing. There is a little um, sort of hole near the top. Um, you want to like you, you want to close that hole using your finger, and this will blow blow up this um, this bag essentially. So you have to blow this up before you put it on the patient. Otherwise, it won't work. Okay, and for more acutely unwell patients who are not responding to um, non rebreathe mask, for example then you might consider them for non-invasive ventilation uh, which is CPAP and BiPAP um, which looks like this kind of um, and you can control the pressures the inspiratory pressures etc um, using the machine here um, and then in the very unwell patients who can't maintain their airway are not responding to all the other forms of oxygen delivery systems then you would consider invasive ventilation uh, where you intubate and you ventilate them. So this uh, table summarizes the different devices, how much oxygen they can deliver and what flow rate that um, you should be setting, um, setting on the oxygen output. Uh, when when you use each of these devices, okay, nasal cannula, the simplest one is used on non-acute wards for patients who are only very mildly hypoxic. The next step up would be simple Hudson mask, which can provide up to ten liters of oxygen, okay, um, forty percent, and um, however, it's not very specific. Like it, you can see that there is a big difference as to how much oxygen is probably going into your patient okay but it's it's a step up from nasal cannula in COPD patients you wanted to use a more targeted system of oxygen delivery uh, these are patients who, have, who can be very oxygen sensitive so um, then you have different colors which are, which are associated with different flow um, percentage of O2 delivery usually you start off with the blue or the white which is the 24 28 percent and then you could use, you can move up, move up the ladder. And finally, the non rebreathe mask, it would provide about 85 to 90% oxygen, 15 liter high flow. So this is what you would use in an acutely unwell patient who is a hypoxic. Okay. Um, so just to, so I, I know I said, um, Patients who need targeted oxygen delivery are usually COPD patients, but there are other patients who can also be CO2 retainers. Um, so these are patients with severe chronic fi um, cystic fibrosis, patients with severe bronchiectasis may also be holding CO2, which means you need to be careful about how much oxygen you give them, as well as people with restrictive conditions such as severe neuromuscular um, diseases things like kyphoscoliosis, which is quite severe, or severe obesity. So it's just something worth remembering. Okay, so some other principles you want to remember. If 
your GCS, if your patient's GCS is 8 or less, this is an indication to intubate and ventilate the patient because there is a high risk that this patient is not going to be able to maintain their own airway. So, and when you do give oxygen, you want to, in a patient, in most patients, you want to aim for SATs between 94 to 98%. In patients who are CO2 retainers or have COPD, um, okay, you want to be more careful. So you want to maintain saturations between 88 and 92%. Okay, I'll tell you why, why this is the case. If the patient's SATs is below 92%, this is an indication to also do an AVG. Okay, so now we're going to move on to respiratory failure. So this, this happens essentially when gas exchange um, is inadequate, which results in hypoxia. Okay, so if you are hypoxic, hypoxemic, this means you have a respiratory failure, okay? However, so hypoxemia is defined as a, a partial pressure of oxygen less than 8 kilopascals, okay? There are two different types of respiratory failure, and this depends on the PaCO2 level, okay? So there's type 1 respiratory failure in which you have a hypoxia, hypoxemia, sorry, with either a normal or a low PaCO2, okay? This is caused by ventilation perfusion mismatch. So either you are well ventilated, okay, but you are not, um, but you don't have adequate perfusion, which is a case in PE, for example, where the blood gets blocked off, or you, are, you have very good perfusion, but your ventilation is quite poor which might be the case in um, things like pulmonary fibrosis, pulmonary edema, etc. So in that picture, you will get hypo hypoxemia, but either a normal PaCO2 or a low PaCO2. Okay, so the reason you might get a low P PaCO2 is that you're probably hyper you start hyperventilating when you when you get hypoxic. So then what would happen is that um, when you hyperventilate, you start blowing off the PaCO2 and therefore it, that reduces, okay? Treatment is, obviously you would treat the cause, find out what's causing it, treat that. You can give oxygen for the hypoxia and in more severe cases, you can consider assisted ventilation. In type 2 respiratory failure, you have a hypoxemia, your PaO2 will be less than 8 kilopascals, but you also have a hypercapnia. So your PaCO2 is above 6, um, six kilopascals, okay? So not only are you hypoxic, you're also hypercapnic. You're holding on to your PaCO2, uh, in, you're holding on to your carbon dioxide. This is caused by alveolar hyperventilation, but you can also have, or you don't have to, but you can also have a VQ mismatch. This is common in obstructive diseases such as COPD, um, as well as in some restrictive, restrictive diseases, as well as if you have a reduced respiratory drive in cases where your lungs are becoming exhausted, um, as well as certain neuromuscular and thoracic wall deformities. Okay, so in this case, again, you would think to think about what's causing it, start treating the cause, Give the patient oxygen, but do so with care. Um, make sure you do an ABG about half, about fifteen minutes after to check um, to check what the situation is. And then, in more severe cases, uh, you could consider assisted ventilation or even intubation. So essentially, in this, oxygen cannot get in, so they're hypoxic, and CO two can't get out, so they're hypercapnic. Okay, so in the, in the actual alveola, alveoli where gas exchange happens, because of hypoventilation in this, 
gas exchange is just is just inadequate essentially okay so you just need to know what type of how to differentiate between the two types and make sure you remember these numbers um, so that you can start thinking about what might be causing it okay so now we're going to move on to asthma and COPD so asthma is an obstructive disease that is characterized by breathlessness, wheeze, and a cough. It affects about 5-8% to 8 of the population and it usually starts in childhood where it's the most common chronic condition. The underlying process is that there is a reversible increase in airway resistance that sort of occurs in episodes and um, it's usually secondary to triggers which are specific to the patient. And essentially what happens is that the bronchial smooth muscles start contracting um, in response to uh, the activation of the muscarinic M3 receptors. There's also an increase in mucosal inflammation and this is secondary to T helper cell activation and cytokine production and also an increase in mucus production, which is also controlled by the M3 receptors. In terms of signs and symptoms, your patient might uh, present with a wheeze, which you can, you, which you in fact can hear without even auscultating. They might be quite breathless. They might feel like they have a tight chest. Um, they might be having a cough and um, this might be secondary to triggers which could be which could really be anything but commonly um, certain allergens like pollen maybe a drug a drug such as NSAIDs or beta blockers pollution cold air exercise and even emotional stress there is usually a history um, of ATP um, in their in their past medical history or even in the family um, so this is known as the atopic march so it's a triad of asthma eczema and hay fever which is allergic rhinitis um, they might have a diurnal variation in the symptoms so it might be worse at night or early in the morning and they could in some some people could also have reduced exercise tolerance in terms of signs um, when you auscultate you might hear an expiratory wheeze which is polyphonic in nature, so it's not a monophonic but a polyphonic wheeze, which is common in asthma and COPD. They might also have a dry cough, they might be tachypneic, they might be hypoxic. So how would you um, how would you diagnose asthma? So there are different tests that are available, but you would use these tests along with your clinical assessment of the patient. So, so the first test we're going to look at is the, the iron nit nitrate test, which essentially measures um, exhaled nitric oxide, which is a marker of eosinophilic inflammation. You also have spirometry, which we talked about, which will show an obstructive picture. There is also something you can do during spirometry called bronchodilator reversibility testing. So essentially, you measure spirometry um, before and 15 minutes after giving um, someone a, a dose of a SABA, so um, salbutamol, for example. And if there is an improvement in the FEV1 of 12% or more, then you know that this person is responding to bronchodilators. You can also use peak expiratory flow, like I talked about earlier. A PEF variability of above 20% or above is um, is indicative of diurnal variation. There's also something called di the direct bronchial challenge, which is sort of used later on. It's not the first test you do. And uh, it it looks at the change in spirometry results after you administer metacholine. Sorry, that should say metacholine. Um, and you look for a 20% or more drop in FEV1. And if this is the case, then again, this is um, more suggestive that there is an underlying asthma. Uh, 
if so you use these tests in patients between the age of um in children between the age of 5 and 16 as well as adults okay along with your clinical assessment but if if the, your patient is under the age of five, then you would just diagnose on symptoms. You wouldn't do these tests because they're too young. And once they hit the age of five, if they are still symptomatic, you would then consider doing the tests. In adults, you would use spirometry and the FENO testing first. If spirometry is positive, you would also proceed to do the bronchodilator reversibility testing. Okay. Um, and then if all of this is un un uncertain, then you would move on to the other tests, such as direct bronchial challenge. In children, you use spirometry first. You don't use uh, the, the nitric oxide test straight away. You use spirometry, and then you see if it's positive, then you do the bronchodilator reversibility. However, if that's uncertain, then you would consider um, the nitric oxide test and, the, and looking at the peak flow variability. Okay. So this is just from NICE guidelines and it shows essentially what we talked about um, but in the form of flowchart which might be easier to read. Um, so in terms of order of tests you can see that it says spirometry for children young people uh, consider bronchodilator reversibility. Um, if, if the child is unable to perform the test um, then then you would um, treat and diagnose based on clinical judgment okay and then if uncertain then you would um, consider the iron nitrate FENO testing so this is for um, children and young people between the ages of 5 to 16 and for adults, so age 17 or over, pheno first and spirometry. So you do the FENO and the spirometry. Um, and then if positive, then you do the bronchodilator reversibility. So essentially what we talked about, uh, but in flowchart form, if you guys want to look at it later on. So in terms of treatment, okay, so we're going to look at treatment in adults. So there are two... Um, two things you want to consider. So you want to consider maintenance therapy to prevent the risk of having an exacerbation and relieve a therapy for when they are actually experiencing symptoms. Okay, so this is sort of easier to look at first. So for relieve a therapy, essentially you start off with um, a SABA, salbutamol, okay, and you keep trying it, but if it's just not working, then you can add sort of you can add a low dose inhaled corticosteroid as well at the same time to, for them to use as a reliever um, and you can also consider adding a long acting beta agonist as well so these come this comes as a combined um, combined uh, inhaler um, it's called it's called a mart a mart regimen so this is when these two come combined okay so first consider SABA and then ICS plus LABA if it's not working um, in terms of maintenance therapy so you would start your patient off with a low dose inhaled corticosteroid okay um, if this doesn't work then you can add a leukotriene receptor antagonist. So that's the second step. It used to be different, but now they've changed it and it actually changes quite often. So you want to keep up with the, the NICE and the, the BTS, the British Thoracic Society guidelines. So these are the two that you, you want to look at. Um, so ICS, then if not, add leukotriene receptor antagonist. If that doesn't work, then um, you can add a LABA Okay, you do ICS plus LABA and you can keep the leukotriene receptor antagonist or you can stop it, stop it if it's really not working. The step up from that would be to increase the dose of inhaled corticosteroid to, modu uh, to moderate um, 
as well as um, continuing the LABA within a March regimen. So when you give these together, um, they have found out that it has a more synergistic effect. effect. Okay, and then if that doesn't work, then you step up to a high dose. Or you can get help. You can refer to specialists. So essentially you try these steps here, the first four steps for each one. If at this point it's not really controlled, then you might want to consider referring to a specialist. So what's more important to know is how would you manage an acute exacerbation of asthma? So this is something you will, as an F1, you might be, um, be in a position where you might have to deal with something like this. So we'll just talk through how, um, how to approach this. So as with any emergency, any acutely unwell patient, you want to use the A, B, C, D, E approach. So airway, breathing, circulation, um, a disability and everything else okay so so you have to the reason it's a b c d is that you assess you always look at so it's in the order of things uh, the order of how quickly things can kill you so if you have an airway problem it can kill you quicker than all of the rest if you have a breathing problem then it can kill you uh, quicker than a circulation problem and so on okay so if there is a fault in an airway you deal with that first before you move on to B, okay? So this is something you want to look at. Um, but essentially, when someone's having an exacerbation of asthma, you want to assess the severity of the attack. So this can be give, done by asking them to do a peak flow, okay? And if the peak flow is above 75% of predicted, then you know that this is a mild attack. If it's less than 75%, it's moderate, however, if the PEFR is either less than 50%, if your patient cannot complete sent sentences when you're talking to them, trying to get to history, or if their respirator is about 25 or pulse rate is above 110, these are criteria for a severe, um, a severe exacerbation of asthma. Okay, There's also life-threatening asthma, which can be remembered by the mnemonic 3392 chest, so 33 stands for PEFR less than 30%, 92 stands less than 92%, cyanosis, hypotension, exhaustion, which might present as a normal PACO2 on an ABG. So this is quite important. Silent chest, so, um, which again suggested that, oh, this patient's tiring out, or if they have a persistent tachycardia. So if, you, if they have all of this, or any of this, then this is a life-threatening asthma. There's also near-fatal asthma, which is obviously the worst, worst severity. This is when, if your patient has a raised PaCO2 on, um, <coughs> on, on an ABG, or, and slash or, if they have the need for mechanical ventilation with raised inflation pressures, to help them help them um, be oxygenated, then these are criteria for a near fatal asthma attack. Okay, so how would you treat a patient with an acute exacerbation? Okay, so there is a mnemonic which is here, which I'm not going to say because this video is going on YouTube, um, which you can use to remember what to do. So if the patient's heart is less than ninety two percent, you start them on high flow oxygen. Okay, um, you then proceed to, to give other things. So the first thing you want to start them on after the oxygen is salbutamol nebulizers. So the dosage is about 2.5 to 5 milligrams. Or if not salbutamol, you can also start another SABA called terbutaline, which you would start off on 10 milligram dose as nebulizers. You can also, along with the salbutamol, you can also add ipratropium nebs if you see that it's not working. But just remember that in, for salbutamol, you can repeat the dose every 15 minutes. You also start your patient on hydrocortisone, 100 milligram IV or prednisolone, 40 milligram. Okay, so you can start all of these yellow, yellow drugs um, 
pretty much when you know when you see the patient oxygen sabitamol give the hydrocortisone if sabitamol working you can add the ibuprofen okay obviously this depends on how bad the attack is for some patients you can give them oxygen and sabitamol and they might be they might be getting much better so depends on the patient okay and at this point you want to escalate if you're worried i mean if you're worried at any point you have to escalate but especially if you find that this patient you assess the severity and you see that this patient has a life threatening asthma then you want to escalate immediately okay on your mind sorry um okay so yeah so you want to escalate immediately so if they have a life threatening asthma escalate give salbutamol nebulizers um and um and you want to give it every 15 minutes but if you're doing this make sure you monitor the ecg and um you can also start them in protropium and you can consider a one off dose of magnesium sulfate but obviously you want to have senior input by then okay so so we talked about magnesium sulfate this is usually given before theophylline even though in the mnemonic it appears after okay theophylline is usually given in an icu setting um if none of this works then of course you want to think about um think about if this patient needs to be sent to icu for ventilator support okay so that's acute exacerbation of asthma so this is something you should know you should also um try and remember the doses as well which comes in quite useful and yeah and make sure you remember the how to assess severity okay so this will come up again in um in fifth year as well final year where emergencies become very important so you know just m- make sure you pay attention to this So this slide talks about uh, blood gases in asthma. The first type of blood gas that you might see in a patient who's having exacerbation is this. So you might have an increased pH, so alkalosis. And you would then want to figure out is this a metabolic alkalosis or respiratory? So you can see that the CO2 is reduced, so therefore it's a respiratory alkalosis but there is no hypoxia really <coughs> um though to is normal uh, slash it can be it can even be raised okay and the reason this picture happens is because when you start having asthma attack you will have an hyp- you will have a hypoxia you then start the respirate starts going up and when this happens you start blowing off the co2 which is what causes the respiratory alkalosis but because you're hyperventilating you then compensate and your hypoxia is um is is uh, essentially compensated for okay so this is what you want to see in in a blood gas with a patient with an asthma attack however there is a second type of blood gas that you might see which you really don't want to which is when you have a reduced ph so an acidosis an increased co2 so rising pso2 okay which indicates that this is a respiratory acidosis but you also have um a hypoxia so the compensation is no longer working therefore this is also a type 2 respiratory failure okay so respiratory acidosis with a type 2 respiratory failure if you see this in a patient with asthma who's having an exacerbation this is a near fatal exacerbation okay their their respiratory dr- that that starting to tire out and they will probably need um they will need to be intubated ventilated etc so if you see this you need to escalate straight away um to make sure that this patient um doesn't progress any further okay so that's the end of asthma so next we're going to talk about COPD So COPD is a chronic condition uh with persistent respiratory symptoms and airflow obstruction okay 
Um, it affects about 3 million people in the UK with a mortality rate of about 30,000 every year. The underlying pathology is a chronic bronchitis, which is clinically defined as a cough uh, that is productive for at least three consecutive months in two years, and an emphysema, which is histologically defined as enlarged air spaces distal to the terminal bronchioles, um, which is combined um, with alveolar wall destruction, which over time can also lead to a small airway fibrosis. Okay, so this is the underlying pathology. In terms of risk factors, the biggest, biggest risk factor is uh, tobacco. Uh, so cigarette smoking is the biggest risk factor, um, especially smoking over a long time and smoking, obviously, a lot more. Other risk factors are indoor air pollution, which can also cause COPD over time, as well as an autosomal dominant condition called alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, um, in which uh, there is a deficiency of a protease inhibitor, which um, prevents, uh, which prevents a breakdown of um, of elastase essentially within within the lung. Sorry, I meant to say that. The, so there is a deficiency in a protease inhibitor, which usually breaks down uh, an enzyme called neutrophil elastase but if when it's deficient that enzyme is more active and because it's an elastase it can uh, break down uh, certain structures in the alveoli which then um which then causes causes destruction of the uh, the alveoli and leads to fibrosis okay um symptoms of copd are things like dys dyspnea, breathlessness, they can have a sort of a chronic cough, uh, bringing up a lot of phlegm, they can also have a wheeze, um, okay, so, and then there's also signs such as tachypnea, they could be using the accessory muscles of respiration, okay, um, I think, I think I have a picture, yeah, yeah, so you can see, so this is someone with COPD, they can have a wheeze, they can have something called pursed lip breathing, okay, uh, which which helps them in patients with severe COPD, it helps them sort of breathe better. They can have um, a chronic cough, something called a barrel chest, dyspnea, prolonged expiratory time, bronchitis, clubbing, an important cause of clubbing COPD. They might be quite thin, they might have muscle wasting due to the constant hypoxic state they're in, um, easily fatigued, frequent infections, accessory muscles of respiration, so like abdominal, sternocleidomastoids. Okay. Um, in severe COPD, because if you can imagine your lungs sort of become fibrosed, so your so the right side of your heart needs needs to work harder to pump the blood through the lung, okay? So essentially you can get a right heart failure in severe COPD, this is called core pulmonale, okay? In this, if you have a right heart failure, the backlog is to the extremities, so you can have um, an increased peripheral venous pressure, enlarged liver spleen, peripheral edema, weight gain, which is, which is due to the edema, um, you know, distended jugular veins, anorexia, complaints of GI distress, etc., etc., ascites, okay? So essentially, blood and stuff starts backlogging into the peripheries because this is the right side of the heart that we're talking about, okay? Fine. Uh, right, so in terms of diagnosis, diagnosing COPD, when you look at things like simple blood tests, full blood counts, in severe cases, you might see an increased pack cell volume. Um, they could have a polycythemia because of long-term hypoxia. Okay, you might you might spot that. On on chest X-ray, they can you can see here that they have an obvious hyperinflation of the chest. You can see a lot of anterior ribs. Um, you can see that the di diaphragm, the hemidiaphragm, is flattened. So there's no, no like a good convex shape here. It's flattened. You might 
if in severe case you might see an enlarged heart okay if they have a heart failure um, they can have reduced peripheral lung markings and increased central um, more central lung markings okay where near where the pulmonary arteries are and in some cases you might see bullae on an ABG you might you might see hypoxemia with or without hypercapnia okay spirometry will show again an obstructive picture just like in asthma and you can use the spirometry results to classify the severity of COPD using the gold classification system so you have four stages and it depends on uh, what your FEV1 is okay In terms of treatment, um, yeah. So in terms of treatment, in chronic COPD, okay. Once the diagnosis is established, what you want to do is, um, you want to make sure that you offer smoking cessation advice if they're doing that. Okay, this is very important to sort of slow down the progression of COPD. Um, you can you should offer annual vaccinations for influenza and the five-yearly pneumococcal vaccination. Um, pulmonary rehab is really useful. So essentially what rehab is that um, patients uh, go to sort of like local community centres where they where, where there are also like a, a, f a group of other people with COPD uh, as well as nurses, physios, who then go through with the patient's um, an exercise program which can help them sort of keep fit and make sure that um, sort of a graded exercise program so it's nothing nothing too intense um, teach them exercise uh, sort of like weight exercises they can do to keep um, to keep healthy uh, diet advice on diet uh, smoking station at um, sort of like education on what COPD is so all sorts of um, things like these are done in pulmonary rehab okay um, you should also make sure that the the patient has a self-management plan this is really important outlining their treatment what to do if they have an attack and if they have other comorbidities then you want to make sure these are optimized okay after all of this is done okay you can start inhaled therapies. The first thing you would offer is either a SABA or a SAMA. Okay. So you offer one one start off with one drug. Also, when when you diagnose something someone with COPD, you also want to try and figure out if they are steroid responsive. So you can do this by giving them 30 milligrams of prednisolone every day for two weeks and then do a spirometry if the FVV1 has risen by more than 15% then you know the COPD is steroid responsive so this means that they might benefit from long-term inhaled corticosteroids so this is just done to make sure that not everyone's given inhaled corticosteroids because these have long-term um, effects as well so you only want to give it to people where it's actually making a difference okay start with SABA or SAMA Okay, if the, then the next step would be if the patient is steroid responsive, you can add a LABA and an ICS. Okay, if the patient's not, then you can add a LABA and a LAMA. Okay, and then the next step essentially is you just give all three of them for all three of the drugs. There are combination inhalers that you can use as well, so um, things like serotide, etc. So, um, those have a combo of like either a LABA, ICS, LAMA, ICS. Okay. And after this point, you want to you want to refer to a specialist. In advanced COPD, um, you again would consider pulmonary rehab if they haven't had it, but you can also think about long-term oxygen therapy. Okay. So this is when the patient is on um, continuous oxygen therapy for at least 15 hours during the day or night. The indications for long-term oxygen therapy is 
that they are clinically stable non-smokers, so they can't still be smoking, with a partial pressure of oxygen less than 7.3. So if this is less than 7.3, um, they're clinically stable non-smokers, then, um, and they're on maximal treatment, then you can, um, then you can consider starting uh, long-term oxygen therapy, or if their PO2 is between 7.3 and 8, but they have signs of pulmonary hypertension, such as right ventricular failure, they have polycythemia, peripheral edema, or nocturnal hypoxia, which sort of suggests that this, you know, is more severe COPD, then again, you can give LTOT. Oxygen can also be given to terminally ill patients. So when you assess someone for long-term oxygen therapy, okay, and you do blood gases, which is what you need to get this value, you need to do the blood gases on two occasions, at least three weeks apart, okay? And you need to be very, you need to be pretty sure that this patient has COPD as well. And they are given, they're being given the optimum medical management and that they're taking it, okay? If the patient is on long-term oxygen therapy and they're still hypercapnic, then you would consider an IV, non-invasive ventilation. You'd also consider home support and psychological support because, as you can imagine, this can be very, very, very tough for, for patients, especially because a lot of them are elderly as well. Okay, so now we're going to look at acute ex ex exacerbation of COPD. This is also very important to remember and to know very well, okay? Again, you'd use an ABCD approach, okay? Same as asthma, ABC ABCD approach. Then you would start them on nebulized bronchodilators, such as salbutamol, okay? You can also start them on ipropropium as well, 500 micrograms, okay? So the doses, so the duration is different, so it's every four hours, okay, you can have this, and ipratribium every six hours, okay. You, you also start them on controlled oxygen therapy, if their saturations are below 88%, or if their ABG oxygen level is less than 7. Start with 24 to 28%, and aim for sats between 88 to 92%, if on the ABG there is no hypercapnia, so you realize that this per person isn't holding on to um, holding on to PaCO2, then they're not a CO2 retainer and they can have a normal SATs, um, SATs level. You can adjust your oxygen therapy according to ABG. You can perform ABG 15 minutes after changing your oxygen or starting them oxygen to see what's going on. Okay, and essentially you want to aim for a PaO2 above 8 with a rise of PaCO2 of less than 1.5 kilopascals. Um, just a side note as to why, why you have to be careful with oxygen in patients who are CO2 retainers. Okay, so normally your, your respiratory drive is dependent not on hypoxia but on hypercapnia okay so if your if your body senses that your paco2 levels are going up it will then increase your respiratory drive this is normally but in patients who have copd or other co2 retaining conditions they have a long term hypercapnia okay as a result, their sensitivity to hypercapnia becomes reduced. Therefore, their respiratory drive is dependent not on hypercapnia, but on, hy on, on the state of being slightly hypoxic. Okay? So, think about what will happen if you overload them with oxygen. The body's then going to think, oh, I have lots of oxygen, I can reduce my respiratory drive. Okay? And then this will become very, very, very bad because the patient will hold on to even more CO2 and they will cause a respiratory acidosis and so on. Okay, so that's why you need to be careful. So you've given the patient salbutamol 
you've given them improtropium, you've started them on oxygen, you're waiting to do an ABG. You can also start them on steroids, which is quite similar to asthma as well. You can start them on IV hydrocortisone, 200 milligrams, or oral prednisolone, 30, and you continue for about a week or two. Okay, and if none of this works, you can consider IV aminophily. Okay, but you would, obviously, whilst you're doing this, if you're worried, you want to escalate to a senior. If they're showing evidence of infection, such as a fever, a productive cough, you know, consider antibiotics such as amoxicillin. This might be an infective exacerbation of COPD, okay, which is quite common. And if this is more progressed and if you're worried, these are the indications for non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. So a respiratory rate of above 30, a pH of less than 7.35, so getting quite acidic, or a rising PaCO2, okay? Any of these, and you would consider um, non-invasive ventilation. If the pH is above uh, less than 7.26, that's quite a, quite an acidosis, yeah, and the PaCO2 is, is rising despite non-invasive ventilation, okay, then you would consider intubating the patient, ventilating them. So that's COPD done. So just final bit on obstructive sleep apnea. So this is a condition in which there is an intermittent closure of the pharyngeal airway. And essentially what happens is that when the patient is asleep, this causes apneic episodes. Okay. And as a result, you have episodes of hypopnea and desaturations during sleep. Causes for this include anything that can cause a nasal obstruction, as well as anything that can cause pharyngeal obstruction. But there are also non-structural risk factors, such as alcohol intake, obesity, smoking, an increased age, being of the male sex, or having a supine sleeping position, and even being in REM sleep. Okay. In terms of symptoms, you usually get sort of a middle-aged obese man who is a smoker or drinks, um, who comes in complaining of loud snoring during sleep, um, which usually the partners notice um, more than the patient. Daytime tiredness, sleepiness, poor sleep quality, morning headaches, decreased libido, reduced cognitive performance, etc. Okay, in terms of classification, um, you can do a questionnaire called the Epoet Sleepiness Scale, where the maximum score is 24, and you can use this in patients with OSA to um, classify them into normal, um, well, either normal, mild, moderate, or severe. In terms of investigations, you do sleep studies and polysom polysomnography, in which they look at things like snoring, the patient's um, movement during sleep, uh, their pulse oximetry. They can also do an EEG or ECG, essentially to look at what's going on when they're sleeping. Um, in terms of management, you'd start off by advising the patient to reduce weight because this really helps. Um, avoid tobacco, alcohol, again, really helps. And um, if if it's not working or if the person has a moderate severe um, obstructive sleep apnea, you'd consider CPAP. So this is like the main, the mainstay of treatment for, for more advanced um, sleep apnea. In very rare cases, um, you could consider surgery. Okay, so that's OSA. Um, and that's also the end of the lecture. Thank you so much for listening. Um, I hope you guys do well in your exams. If you have any questions, please email on either of these emails. And um, if you guys have any feedback, um, I would really appreciate it. Uh, good luck with your exams, guys. Take care. Thank you so much for listening.